Hello, good evening students. Welcome to our block revisions. Uh, the unit is the financial management. Uh, I understand that we've uh, studied uh, throughout the semester and of the few period that is remaining, it's just uh, to boost and enable us to get the concepts before we go to the exam room. So welcome to our revisions today, uh, whereby we shall be tackling a number of questions. Uh, and I believe uh, when we work together, you'll be able to grasp the concept that you had forgotten or you wanted to uh, to look into. So today I want us to look at our questions uh, in the April exam. Uh, that is April 2023. This is just the previous sitting that we had already tackled. So uh, I understand and I believe that you had uh, looked at them. So we are just confirming if we are correct. So uh, our first question, our first question will be in a uh, question number one, part B. Question number one, part B, which talks of uh, capital budgeting, which talks of capital budgeting. To start on uh, this concept, we first of all need to understand the concept of capital budgeting and uh, why do we need to do capital budgeting. So capital budgeting, we understand that as a business, we normally have uh, various projects that we need to undertake, but we have a question on which project are we going to take or which project are we going to start up with. So capital budgeting is where, uh, this is where it comes in, whereby we try and analyze and see uh, the, uh, the best project that we are going to take, right? So under capital budgeting, we normally have various uh, uh, analysis processes. We have analysis processes that we need to undertake for us to identify the best project. And some of the analysis will include, so this uh, analysis is normally known as appraisal, appraisal techniques. Appraisal techniques and the appraisal techniques we normally classify them into two. We have We have two main appraisal techniques. The first one is known as a uh, uh, Non-discounting techniques Under non-discounting techniques, we normally have two, uh, two appraisals. The first one is known as the payback period. And the second one is normally the accounting, accounting rate of return. Payback period and the accounting rate of return. Then the second one is known as the discounting techniques. Discounting techniques uh, and this one has several uh, appraisal techniques which include the net present value The net present value which is the NPV we also have uh, the internal rate of return Which is the IRR we also have the profitability index which is the PI number four is the discounted payback period the discounted payback period then lastly, we have the modified internal rate of return. Modified internal rate of return. 
those are the main techniques that we shall be having when it comes to appraisal of an investment project uh, when it comes to appraisal of an investment project so once you have all these techniques then you uh, you'll you'll ask yourself how are they used how are they used and first of all you ask yourself why is why are these two under non-discounted and the remaining ones are under discounted the first two are under non-discounted techniques because they normally use uh, the previous or the they are mostly uh, classified as non-discounted because they do not give the correct criteria they do not give the correct assumptions of a given project for instance under payback period we only consider we only consider the time which we shall recover our initial outlay but it does not give us the true profitabilities of the project under accounting rate of return uh, it normally uses the accounting profit and as we know there are shortcomings on the accounting profits which is normally used that is why they are considered under non-discounted techniques this uh, category of discounting techniques they are normally considered considered as the discounting techniques because they normally follow the ideal they are always recognized as the ideal measures of a project for instance under the net present value it will always consider the total useful life of the project it will consider the total useful life of the project that is the first one it will also consider uh, the the true profitability of a project it considers the true profitability of a project and as we said uh, true profitability of a project is always determined by discounting the cash flows so uh, the discounting techniques will always discount its cash flows at any given point of time and that is why they are considered as discounting techniques so on the sitting that we have on the sitting that we have the april 2023 question number 1b 2023 question number 1b that's the question that we have i'll read it loud Sipo Limited is evaluating an investment project which requires the importation of new machine at a cost of 3.7 million. The machine has a useful life of 6 years and a salvage value of 1 million. We have additional information. The following additional costs are incurred in relation to the machine. We have the modification cost of 1 million, import duty of 900,000, installation cost of 375,000, freight charges of 225,000. The machine is expected to increase the company's annual cash flow before tax as shown below. Increase in cash flows, we have them uh, from year one to year six. The machine is, is to be fully depreciated over the useful life using the straight line method. The corporate tax rate is 30%, while the cost of capital is 10%. The maximum acceptable payback period for the company for all capital projects is four years. Required, total initial cost, annual net cash flows, payback period of the machine, the net present value of the machine, and lastly, advise the company's management on whether to import the machine based on your results in B3 and B4 above. So that is the question uh, that we are asked. So here we have a question where it asks us two categories. We have the payback period and we have the net present value. As we said earlier in our discussion, we said that uh, discounting techniques are always considered uh, as the best tools for analysis. When you analyze with the non-discounting techniques, you will always be required to analyze further. It will always, uh, you'll always be advised to analyze further for you to get a concrete concrete result or the concrete outcome to base on your decision so currently we are asked in part a to determine the total initial cost total initial cost of the machine so allow me to rub here the total initial cost of the machine that is part a
total initial cost. When you are asked to determine the total initial cost, you are asked to determine the total cost of the machine, total cost incurred. And we said that to get the total cost, we always take the cost of the machine plus any incidental cost, plus any incidental cost. And this incidental cost will always be the cost incurred in setting up the machine for it to be functional. So any cost that is incurred before operation of the machine will always be identified as initial cost. So in this case, we are told that the cost of the machine is 3.7. So the cost of the machine is 3.7 million. Let's have our shillings in thousands. So the cost of the machine is 3.7 million. Then we are told under additional information, the following additional cost will be incurred in relation to the machine. The first one we are, we are told modification cost. Modification cost will always be part of the cost of the machine. So here we shall add modification cost. Modification. Modification cost. Modification cost, which we are told it's one million. Our shillings are in thousands, remember. We have the import duty. We have the import duty of 900,000. We also have installation cost. Installation cost. Installation cost of 375,000. 375,000. Then you have the freight charges. Freight charges. The freight charges of 225 225 in note number two we are told that the machine is expected to increase the company's annual cash flow before tax as shown below note number two will not be part of initial cost because those costs are after the machine is being functional right so those ones will not be part of initial cost so we need to sum this up to get the total initial cost to get the total initial cost and in this case, we shall use our calculator. So our total cost here will be 6.2, will be 6.2. So that is our total cost as per the examiner's requirement. Total cost as per the examiner's requirement. And that will be our total cost. Part two, we are asked to determine the annual net cash flows. Annual net cash flows. The annual net cash flows and at this point we need to determine uh, the components of cash flows components of cash flows one of them we've seen is the annual net cash flow as our component uh, so we normally have three components of cash flows we normally have three components of cash flows that is the initial outlay initial outlay we have the annual net cash flows and the terminal cash flows these three are basically used when we are analyzing projects using the discounted techniques using the discounted techniques so those three will always be uh, be used so in this case our annual net cash flows annual net cash flows are basically the cash flows that are obtained in an investment project during the life of the project during the life of the project so once you've already set up your project those profits and the losses that you get throughout the life of the project are always known as the annual net cash flows and in this case we need to identify the useful life of that project which we are told is six years so the number of years we have six years
six years. So these are the years. So the first thing that we need to get, we are told that we are told that the increased in note number two, the machine is expected to increase the company's annual cash flows before tax as follows. We are having 1760, 1760 in year one, we are having 1360 in year two, we are having 1050 in year three, we are having 900 in year four, 840, 840 in year five, and lastly 750 in year six. So this is the profit before tax, profit before tax. So we need to have, we need to know that we have two ways of determining our annual net cash flows. So first way of determining, determining our annual net cash flow is if we are asked to determine the, uh, the project basing on accounting rate of return or to determine the uh, annual net cash flow basing on basing on uh, the net present value. So if it's uh, basing on the net present value, then we need to determine uh, to determine the cash flows at the end of the year, but not the accounting profit. And since here we are told the annual net cash flows, it means that we are not going to determine the accounting profits, but we are going to determine the cash flows, right? So to get the cash flows, we only consider the cash items, the cash items. Here we are not going to consider depreciation, not that one we are not going to de consider depreciation. But as much as we are considering our cash, uh, our cash flows, remember depreciation forms uh, a major part, forms a major part on depreciation, uh, on determining the cash flow. This is the reason, in the presence of uh, depreciation, in the presence of depreciation, we normally have a concept which is known as the tax shield, tax shield right a tax shield when you talk of a tax shield this is just a benefit that we obtain the benefit that we obtain when we have depreciation in our books when we have depreciation in our books and this will always happen because depreciation reduces the amount of profit right depreciation reduces the amount of profit right it reduces the amount of taxable profits to be specific. So if it reduces the amount of taxable profit, this tells us that it will also reduce the amount of tax, right? It will also reduce the amount of tax. So that effect is what we shall have to cover it here. That is what we shall have to cover here. By saying, first of all, we shall less the tax component. We shall less the tax component, which is a we are told that the tax rate is 30%. The tax rate is 30%. So 30% will be 30% on all the cash flows that we have. So we shall have 1760 multiplied by 30%, which is 528. So that is what we less in year one. Then we take 1360 multiplied by 30%, which is 408. So here we have 408 as our tax. Then 1050 times 30%, which is 315, 315. Then we have 900 times 30%, which is 270, 270. We have 840 times 30%, which is 252. 252 then lastly 750 750 times 30 percent which is 225 225 that is the tax aspect then after lessing our tax we need to uh, consider the concept of depreciation tax shield depreciation tax shield we've just said that depreciation tax shield is just the benefit that we get on having depreciation into our books so depreciation tax shield 
will always be obtained by taking the depreciation amount depreciation amount multiplied by the tax rate multiplied by the tax rate depreciation amount multiplied by the tax rate remember this is just a saving that you are getting that is just a saving that you are getting on having depreciation in our books so how will we get uh, the depreciation we are told that depreciation is on straight line method depreciation is on straight line method so to get your depreciation to get your depreciation we shall always take the cost of the asset minus the scrap value divided by number of useful life the useful life of the asset divided by number of years number of years so in this case uh, the cost of the asset will be the total cost will be the total cost which is 6200 we take 6200 minus the scrap value we are told that the scrap value of the asset is 1 million so here you take 1 million then you divide by number of life the number of life which is six years so here we shall take 6200 minus 1000 divided by six so here we are told is 866.67 866.67 that is our depreciation so in this case we are not concerned about depreciation but we are concerned with the savings that we get on depreciation which is the dts so we say that to get your dts we take your depreciation multiplied by the tax rate so here it will be 866.67 multiplied by the tax rate of 30 percent 0.03 so here we multiply by 30 percent which is 260 which is 260 to 60 this is our DTS so DTS we normally add on our annual net cash flow so we add 260 on every year 260 on every year right so here when you add we shall get our annual net cash flows our annual net cash flow so in year one is 1760 minus 528 plus 260 which is 1492 1492 in year two is 1360 minus 408 plus 260 which is 12 12 year 3 is 1050 minus 315 plus 260 which is 995 year 4 is 900 minus 270 plus 260 which is 890 then year 5 is 840 840 minus 252 plus 260 which is 848 then lastly it's 750 minus 225 plus 260 which is 785 that is our annual net cash flows annual net cash flows this is our annual net cash flows for all the six year period and that is how we tackle part b when you look at part c part three we are asked to determine the pay payback period of the machine payback period of the machine allow me to wrap down here payback period of the machine
the payback period of the machine. We said that the payback period, it is just the duration in which the company takes to recover the initial outlay. The duration in which the company takes to recover the initial outlay. With this regard, our initial outlay is the total cost, the 6200. That is what we had we had uh, invested in the project. So in this case, what is the period which we shall take to recover uh, uh, the initial outlay, right? So we shall be using the total cost of 6200 against the annual net cash flows, against the annual net cash flows. And here, we need to understand that we are having irregular cash flows. We are having irregular cash flows. So the ideal period will be determined by use uh, of a table. So here we shall say, we shall have the, mm -hmm, the years, then we have uh, cash flows, Then we shall have the cumulative, cumulative cash flows. The cumulative cash flows. So remember here we want to recover our 6,200 or uh, 6.2 million. Our cash flows are in thousands. So for you to determine the cumulative cash flows, we shall always take the total cash flow for that particular period plus the total previous pe uh, cash flow for the pre previous periods. So in year one, it will be a total of 1492. 1492. In year two, it will be 1212 plus the total cumulative cash flows for the previous period. So it's 1212 plus 1492, which we are having. Twenty-seven zero four. That is for year two. For year three, it will be nine hundred and ninety-five plus the total cumulative cash flows for the for the previous period, which is nine ninety-five plus twenty-seven zero four, which is thirty-six ninety-nine. Then. Uh, in year four, it's 890 plus the total cumulative in the previous period. So it will be uh, 3699 plus 890, which is 4589. Then in year five, we shall add 848. Then lastly, it will be uh, plus 785 which is 6222 so this tells us that in year 6 we shall have an excess of 6222 we only require 6200 right so in this case here we don't need extra we only want to determine the period which is, which is, which it will take for us to recover our 6200 so in this case we shall have our 6200 here 6200 here because when you take 5437 plus the total of 7, 785 it will amount to 6222 uh, and that is excess so here we determine how much is it remaining in year five that we need to recover uh, in year six so it will be 6200 minus 5437 which is 763. So this is what it's remaining. But we have 785 uh, in, uh, as the total amount in year 6. So we need to determine the duration that we'll need exactly to get the 6200. So here we shall use a formula which states that to get your payback period, to get your payback period, 
we shall take the complete years complete years plus the remaining amount remaining amount divided by the cash flows for that particular period cash flows for the period cash flows for the period so that is the formula which we'll use to get the total payback period so here we say our complete years will be from year one to year five they are all complete because we have utilized the full annual cash flows so our complete years are five years plus the remaining amount the amount remaining to recover in year six is 763 763 then we divide by the total cash flow for that particular period which is 785 785 and this one here will give us the payback period it will give us the payback period so we say five times five plus 763 divided by 785 which is 5.971 so here we shall utilize 5.971 years 5.971 years and that will be our payback period that will be our payback period at this particular level and that is part three of the question Part four of the question requires us to determine the net present value, the net present value. So to get your net present value, to get your NPV, we always take The discounted cash inflows minus the initial outlay. Discounted cash inflows minus the initial outlay. So this is how we get our, uh, our NPV. And what we need to understand that discounted cash inflows will always entail two components of cash flows and that is the annual net cash flows and the terminal and the terminal cash flows those are the two components of cash inflows because these ones are always the cash flows that we attain during the life of the asset then our initial outlay will always represent uh, the cash outflows it will always represent the cash outflow i've not said discounted cash outflow because uh, in many cases we always uh, get our initial outlay at year zero therefore even if we discount it we'll always get the same the same value as what we have so it's not always necessary for us to discount the initial outlay so in this case i would like like us to complete this initial cost so allow me to rub part three but i will maintain the answer so under the total cost here we will always continue adjusting it in case of in case of uh, npv so to get your total initial cost, total initial cost, we always take the total cost plus any other cost associated with that project. So in this case, we shall determine the working capital. If we have the working capital, we'll always add the working capital component as part of the total cost. And when we look at the question, when we look at the question, we have no working capital we have no working capital 
we have no working capital so this total cost will still be we still be our total initial cost so we have our total initial cost we have our annual net cash flow so the last part that we need to determine is the terminal terminal cash flows terminal cash flows the terminal cash flow is always a cost that we get the cost that we get at the end of the useful life when we are disposing of the project when we are disposing of the project so in this case we shall always uh, use the scrap value we shall always use the scrap value so to get your terminal uh, cash flows we shall take the scrap value of the project scrap value of the project which is 1 million scrap value of the project which is 1 million then we add then we add recovery recovery of working capital recovery of working capital we have none so our total terminal cash flow will be 1 million our total terminal cash flow will be 1 million so in this case we've already identified our terminal cash flow but remember on getting our npv we are told discounted cash inflows so the all the cash inflows that we have here we need to discount them and we have our terminal cash flow and we have our annual net cash flow terminal cash flow and the annual net cash flow let's start by discounting our terminal cash flows So on the terminal cash flow, uh, we are having a cost of capital on the question note number four. The corporate tax rate is 30% while the cost of capital is 10%. So here we'll determine the present value interest factor at 10% how many years? Six years. 10% six years. We normally have a table we normally have a table which will give us the present value interest factor we can always use a table or you can use the formula to get the present value interest factor by use of a formula we always say you take uh, the future value multiplied by 1 plus r raised to power negative n remember we are discounting so on discounting we always use negative n future value into bracket 1 plus r raised to power negative n our future value in this case is the 1000 and our required rate of return is the 10 percent and the n here is six years so by use of our formula we shall say 1000 times 1 plus r our r is 10 percent which is equivalent to 0 0.1 then we raise to power negative 6 we raise to power negative 6 this gives us 564.4739 564 0.4739 that is the present value interest factor for the terminal cash flow 564.4739 so at this case again we'll discount the cash flows the annual net cash flows for every period for every period we shall maintain the same formula we shall maintain the same formula because the cash flows that we have here are irregular cash flows i want to believe that we all know to distinguish between irregular cash flows and regular cash flows in other terms we are talking about uh, discounting of a lump sum and discounting of an annuity that's a concept and a time value of money so in this case we shall determine the present value interest factor uh, at 10 percent for each period right 
So 10% year one, 10% year one. So you're having 1492 multiply by, so this annual net cash flows will always take the place of the future value. Will always take the place of future value. They'll always take the place of future value. Then the year, the respective years will always take the place of the number of periods. Then our required rate of return will be 10%. That one will always be maintained as per the cost of capital provided by the examiner. So in this case, you're having 1492 multiplied by 1 plus 0 0.1. 1 plus 0 0.1 raised to power negative 1. So here we are having 1356, 1356.3636. 1356.3636. In year 2, we shall be having 1212 raised to power negative 2 which is 1001 0.6529 0.6529 1001.6529 in year 3 our 995 will be uh, will be our future value then our n will be negative 3 the cost of capital will maintain. So here we are having 747, 747.5582. 5582. Then in year 4, we are having 890 raised to power negative 4, which we are having 607.8882. 2. In year 5, we are having 848 raised to power negative 5. Which is 526. Point five four one three. Five four one three. Then lastly we are having seven eighty five raised to power negative six, which is four hundred and forty three point one one two zero. One one two zero. So once you've determined the present value for each period, you will sum up all the uh, present values. You sum up all the present values to determine uh, a single value. So it will be 1356.3636 plus 1001.6529 plus 747.5582. Point five five eight two plus six zero seven point eight eight two zero plus five twenty six point five four one three plus four forty three point one one two zero. Our answer will be four sixty forty six eighty three. Point one one, and that is the discounted annual net cash flows. So to get our NPV, we say that we take the discounted cash inflows minus the initial outlay. So here we have our annual net cash flow of 46, 4683.11 plus our terminal cash flows, terminal cash flow of 564, 564.4739. Then we less our initial outlay of 6200. We less our initial outlay of 6200. So in this case, our NPV will be 4683.11 plus 564, 
4739 minus 6200 which you are having a negative of 952 we are having a negative of 952.4161.4161 so we are done with the part uh, three of the question part four of the question sorry So we are asked in part 5, advise the company's management on whether to import the machine based on your results in B3 and B4 above. Based on the results in B3 and B4 above. So, basing on the discounted, uh, on the payback period, basing on the payback period, we have 5.971 years. And basing on the NPV, we have negative 952 0.4161 so basing on these two results let's start with the payback period let's start with the payback period on advising an investor on whether to adopt a project basing on payback period we first of all need to set the minimum payback period we need to set the minimum payback period so in this case in note number five we are told the maximum acceptable payback period for the company for all capital projects is four years <coughs> So here, four years is the maximum payback period. But in this question, we are going to determine or to get our payback, uh, our payback period after five years. So in case the payback period is more than the one set by the management, we always reject the project. So basing on our payback period, we will reject the project because the number of years taken to recover our initial outlay is more than the one that is set by the management it's more than the one set by the management and also under npv on advising basing on npv we said that an npv that uh, a positive npv we will always accept the project while a negative npv we will reject the project here we are having a negative npv in this case we will reject the project basing on npv so generally since we have rejected basing on payback period and we reject basing on npv our advice will be reject reject the project reject the project we reject the project and that is the answer to this particular question when you look at it uh, it has got uh, 12 marks in total so you need to be very keen in all levels of answering so you need to be very keen in answering all the levels in this particular question <laughs>